Yes. So thank you very much. Uh, and um, the beginning, uh, let me say some kind of motivations of why I'm interesting uh, of non-commutative algebraic varieties. So uh, how they appear actually. So what kind of motivations here? So, um, or maybe. So at first, of course, the uh, non-commutative varieties appear. So when we talk about uh, usual varieties, like an algebra, for example, x is a spectrum of algebra, then of course, if we consider some kind of non-commutative deformation of A, then we obtain something that we call a non-commutative variety. So something that is, can be right as a spectrum of non-commutative algebra K. Don't care about what this means. So, uh, so second, that uh, non-commutative varieties appear uh, by themselves. So for example, non-commutative algebras, non-commutative algebras, like uh, in Lie theory, for example, a universal uh, envelope algebra. Uh, also, uh, I want to say then when I write here non-commutative algebraic variety, I also mean that non-commutative and derived together. So I mean that it's uh, reasonable to consider uh, together uh, non-commutative uh, extension of the usual uh, varieties and derived extension. What means derived? For example, the stacks and high stacks. Uh, give you some kind of derived algebraic varieties. So, but usually people, when they consider stacks, high stacks, they are talking about derived commutative algebraic varieties. So, and I want to say that it's uh, reasonable to consider together, again, two extensions of the usual commutative algebraic geometry in non-commutative case and in the derived case. So what kind of motivation? So another thing, it's a uh, modular spaces. At least the local, local structure of modular spaces. What kind of modular spaces? So for example, shifts, shifts on usual variety. The actually the right modular space, the the right modular space should be together non-commutative and derived and derived. So I'm not going to talk about it today, but just to mention it. So another thing as a motivation. So again that the non-commutative non and derived varieties appears as a part, as parts of uh, usual commutative varieties. So I will talk about it on the second lecture. So it's exactly that I'm going to discuss actually and um, and then maybe here because it's uh, some kind of activity of homological mirror symmetry then in homological mirror symmetry uh, non-commutative varieties appears in natural way naturally uh, just uh, let me give uh, uh, briefly the example. So let us consider the usual uh, projective plane and then consider the homological mirror symmetry to the usual uh, uh, 
projective plane, then it will be some kind of uh, variety. So it will be m bar with a superpotential double V to the C, where m bar is a fiber-wise compactification of C star square with a superpotential uh, that is equal x plus y plus 1 divided by x, y to C. So it's a uh, two-dimensional torus. It's a superpotential. And we consider the fiber-wise comp compactification. So we obtain something that is a, uh, over A1 that has a fibers elliptic curves and some kind of degeneration three of degeneration of these elliptic curves. So it's a M bar here. And the mirror symmetry for CP2 is a such uh, so-called Landau-Ginsburg model with uh, some kind of symplectic form here that is actually such that the class of this symplectic form in the second cohomologies of M bar R is actually trivial. But of course, this group is not trivial. And we can consider some kind of deformation of uh, variation of symplectic form here. So let us consider uh, some kind of another symplectic form, omega prime here, such that the class of omega prime is not, is not equal zero. And we can ask what is the mirror symmetry after that. So here, uh, it's a general principle. If you consider variation of symplectic form on one side, so this implies some kind of deformation of complex structure. So deformation of complex structure here. So we have to consider, we have to obtain some kind of uh, deformation of the usual complex projective plane. But we know that we don't have any kind of uh, usual commutative deformation here. So, and the answer actually that the homological mirror symmetry here, it's a non-commutative deformation of the uh, complex projective plane. So, for example, in the sense of Artin Tate Vandenberg, So, and um, this is exactly what I wanted to say, that the non-commutative deformation of the usual varieties are really natural, because on the homological, on, on the mirror side, it's a just a variation of symplectic form that is absolutely natural things in symplectic geometry. So this means that we have to consider non-commutative deformations of the usual varieties. So it's some kind of motivations. So now let us start. And we start from the uh, usual varieties. So let, let x be a scheme that I will consider that this scheme is quasi-compact. and uh, separated. So actually, it's, it's possible to, uh, it's, it's, uh, there, uh, there is a way to consider more general uh, case when it's quasi-separated. Uh, and uh, if we have a such scheme, then we can consider the abelian category of quasi-coherent shifts here. So it's abelian category. And after that, we have to pass to the derived category of this abelian category. And this is unbounded derived category. It's really huge because the, this category is a bigger and this is unbounded category. So it has a all arbitrary so arbitrary direct sums so uh, it's a category that we are going to consider actually 
in the case of some kind of remark here, the, I'm not going to talk about quasi-separated case, but anyway, so remark. So in quasi-separated case, you have to consider the uh, category of OX modules with quasi-coherent cohomologies. That is in separated cases exactly this category, but in quasi-separated category uh, case, uh, in general quasi-separated categories, it's a, it's a different category. So anyway, I will talk about this case. So, so now we have a such category. It's a really big, and um, there is another category that is very important here. So it's called the category, so triangulated category of perfect complexes. So of course, any derived category is a triangulated. As derived. So I'm not going to talk what is triangulated category. I think that everybody knows uh, what is it. So there is another uh, uh, important category here that is uh, called the category of perfect complexes. So it's a subcategory in the this big category of all quasi-coherent shifts here. And by definition, a complex of quasi-coherent shifts is called perfect if it's locally quasi-isomorphic to a bounded complex of locally free shifts of finite type. Shortly, we usually uh, say that it's vector bundles. So this means that this complex, so this means that locally, locally means that there is a covering of your scheme such that uh, Locally, this complex is quasi-isomorphic. So there is a morphism between complexes any, anyway. So uh, the complex of bounded complex of vector bundles. So this means it's bounded. And these guys are vector bundles here. So we can consider just only such objects in our big category. And they form the full subcategory of perfect complexes. Why this category is so important? At first, it's a really small. And it also has a, another uh, description. In, uh, in, in, in so it has a, another description in internal terms of big category of D quasi Koch X. So at first, I want to mention that in the good, maybe, to say some words uh, in the good case, in a good case, so for example, quasi-projective variety. Uh, actually, uh, this category of perfect complexes can be described as a bounded derived category of vector bundles on X. So where this category is a category of vector bundles on X, so locally free shifts of finite type is a exact exact in sense of quillian category and we can consider the bounded derived category so this means that in this in good case so quasi projective is a good enough then it's not only locally but globally also quasi isomorphic the bounded uh, complexes of vector bundles uh, so the category of perfect complexes has another description in the internal terms of these big categories. So actually, the category of perfect complexes is, 
is equal to the category of coincide with the category of compact objects. So it's a category of compact objects. What this means, so what is a, wh when, when object is called compact, so the definition is following. So it's uh, for any triangulated category. So let T be a uh, triangulated category with uh, arbitrary direct sums. Then the object E from T is called compact. If the home from this object to any direct sum is actually commutes with a direct sum. So of course, it's every time commutes if it's direct, if the sum is a finite. But if it's infinite, of course, in the general case, it's not commute. So this means that actually the any home from the infinite direct sum goes through the finite direct sum. So it's a reason why this object is called compact. So another, it's a result of Neiman actually, that the category of perfect complexes is coincide with the category of compact object on X. So this means that we can produce this category of perfect complex directly from the big category of all quasi-coherent shifts, just considering the compact object there. So, and now uh, I would like to formulate the theorem, which is due to unknown Neiman in the this case that I actually consider here, so quasi-compact and separated. And if it's the case is quasi-separated, uh, this, uh, uh, this result is also true uh, if you're using this remark. And it's go to the uh, Bondel and Vandenberg, this generalization. So the theorem is the following. So the category first statement, uh, the category Bounded derived, uh, uh, unbounded derived category of quasi-coherent shifts on X, uh, uh, compactly generated, is and the second, the category of perfect complexes has a classical generator. So to explain this theorem, I have to give a definition of the, what means the compactly generated and what is a classical generator, actually. So the first definition, uh, when, the category, uh, when a category is called the compactly generated. So let T be a... Uh, uh, triangulated category with all direct sums. We say it is compactly generated. If for any object f from t that is not trivial, there is a compact object E such that the home from this compact object E to f is not trivial. So this means the compact object C 
all objects in our category, what means, means C. This means that we can find that object compact such that the, we have a non-trivial home to F. So this means that they see them. It's called the compactly generated. So this means that we have enough uh, compact objects. Actually, it's uh, equivalent, this definition equivalent to say that uh, the smallest triangulated subcategory of T that contains all compact objects and closed undertaking uh, undertaking all direct sums coincides with the whole T. It's not that, it's, it's a result, actually, of Amnon Neiman. So it's a, some kind of statement. Another definition, so it's a, exactly that I explained. I explained that this category of quasi-coherent shifts on X has enough compact objects. It's compactly generated. It's the first statement. Pardon? Uh, yeah, if you have uh, all direct sums, and it's a triangulated subcategory that you have uh, all direct summons, it's some kind of telescope construction. It's inside here. Yeah. Uh, the, the definition of a classical generator. The, the definition of classical generator is actually uh, due to some kind of... Uh, so th th this category is a huge, I mean, that uh, is a really big uh, category of all uh, unbounded category of quasi coherent shift. But this category is really small. So and the uh, definition of classical generator is actually uh, works in the case of the small categories. So an object E from the category, let us use another letter N, uh, it's a triangulated category. Uh, is called a classical generator. If uh, the smallest triangulated uh, full, every time, of course, triangulated subcategory, actually full sometimes in the definition of triangulated subcategory. So the smallest full triangulated subcategory that contains E and, uh, and closed undertaking direct summons uh, coincides with the whole T. So here it's exactly that we need, so direct summons here. Uh, and um, uh, because we don't have any kind of, uh, I don't ask to have uh, all sums so and actually it's a, in this case it's not we don't have any kind of all sums here so it's a small category and this is a very important here so uh pardon oh, oh n yes thank you oh, sorry yes it's okay thank you very much with the whole n yes so uh Maybe just to fill it, uh, some kind of examples. So suppose that we have a, a fine scheme. What is the kind of uh, uh, classical generator we have here? Just a structure shift.
is a classical generator. Why? Because what is a perfect complex is actually? The perfect complex is a, is a category of the, of that consists of the bounded complexes of projective modules. That's all. So now we have all projective modules because we have all direct summons. So of course we have A, we can consider the uh, finite direct sums here and take any projective module as a direct summon. After that, we have to consider the category that is a triangulated subcategory, so it's closed uh, under cones. So this means that we have all finite complexes. So all finite complexes of projective space. So we have projective uh, models. So this means that it's exactly the classical generator in this case. But if X is uh, projective or quasi-projective, quasi-projective uh, variety. So what is kind of classical generator can be found here? Uh, for example, so uh, of course in the general case OX is not enough. So even in the case X is a projective line, structure shift is not a generator here. Uh, why? Uh, because it's uh, what it's generated, it generated so it doesn't have any kind x between them. So it's a uh, uh, Holmes from O x to itself is it just a constant. So we just generated everything that is uh, just these objects. That's all, and all its shifts and direct sums. So, but in in quasi-projective space, we can do the following thing. So O x is not enough, but if you consider some kind of, uh, if we consider some kind of very ample line bundle, and if we consider the object that is a direct sum of OX plus L plus L square plus so on plus LR for some R that is uh, big enough. It will be a classical generator of our category. Moreover, it's some kind of statement that actually R can be taken as a dimension of X. So dimension X, X is enough to, to have a classical generator. So it's kind, some kind of examples. So, okay, I explained the theorem of Neiman, and what is now the main idea So, the main idea of uh, this approach to non-commutative derived algebraic geometry is to pass so the main idea here so roughly speaking so main idea is to pass from x to the categories, for example, pair categories of pair of X and the unbounded derived category of quasi-coherent shifts on X. And as you see that this category is just a compact object here, so we can talk about just only this category. Or if you want, we also can talk about this category because in the case that I will talk uh, now, so in the case of DG enhancements, uh, this category can be also reconstructed from this small category. So more, uh, I want to say that information is the same. So we can consider both of them. We can take only this one. <coughs> this is a compact object there. Or we can take this one. And this category can be also constructed from this one. So the main idea is to pass uh, from X 
to this category. And the theorem of Neiman says us that actually this is not arbitrary category, but the special category categories. So this category is a compactly generated, and this category has a classical generator that will be important for us. So it's not a arbitrary triangulated categories. It's a special triangulated categories. But uh, so uh, of course, when we pass from x to these categories, then there is a natural questions here. Then, so how much information we lost? And so, so for example, the question uh, about is there any kind of x and y such that the perf x is actually the same as the perf y? So I'm not going to discuss this question, and just only to mention that uh, first there are, th there are such varieties, and the, uh, they are called the Fourier Mukai partners. So the Fourier Mukai partners, and uh, the first example is due to Mukai. That is, uh, if x is abelian variety and y is a dual abelian variety, then we have such equivalence. Um, but variety, abelian variety and dual abelian variety not necessarily isomorphic. Or uh, some kind of flops also here. And in general, it's uh, uh, related to examples of many examples of Calabi Yao varieties. And it's uh, there is a special reason for it. So uh, it's exactly that I'm not going to discuss. But what I'm going to discuss, I, uh, I don't want to consider the triangulated category. So these categories are triangulated. Uh, maybe. So right here, so triangulated. Categories. But I'm going to discuss about differential gradient categories and so called differential gradient enhancements of these triangulated categories. So these two categories are differential gradient <coughs> categories. And they are called the uh, differential gradient enhancements of triangulated categories perf x and quasi Koch X. Maybe I have to say just a few words about differential gradient categories and how we obtain enhancements here. So, so what is differential gradient category? So the definition is uh, just very simple. Uh, the differential gradient category is a category that enriched over the category of complexes. So what this means enriched? Enriched means that the homes now between objects. So just to not forget. So, uh, so the definition, so AGG differential gradient category. I uh, forgot to say that everything over some field K every time, so starting from the variety k arbitrary field, base field. So this means that all categories are k linear, and dg category is a k linear category whose morphisms between two objects 
are complexes of vector spaces. And the composition is go through the tensor product of complexes. And also maybe need to say that uh, for any object there is a, a identity. And this identity has a degree 0. And it's uh, closed. So it's pretty natural. So now the homes between objects are the complexes. That's all. And um, for any differential graded uh, category A, let us denote by A. So for any differential graded category A, we can consider the homotopy category. It's a homotopy category. So this means that uh, it has the same objects. as A, but Holmes Holmes in the homotopy category from E to F is it just a zero cohomology. So we have a complexes. So this means that it has a cohomology and we can take the zero cohomology here. Zero cohomology of home from E to F in the differential gradient category A. That's all. And, uh, and enhancement, so, and we just say that A is a differential gradient enhancement of its homotopy category. That's all. So, of course, we are interested in the special case when this homotopy category is triangulated, naturally actually triangulated. And uh, I'm not going to talk about it uh, more, but just say that in this case, this differential gradient category is called pre-triangulated. So in uh, all our examples, all differential gradient category are actually the pre-triangulated. So this means that the homotopy category is triangulated. So this is a definition of more or less the definition of uh, enhancement. And um, And of course, it's uh, very uh, natural to define the, what is a DG functor. I am not going to say the definition because it's a uh, direct. And uh, the, main, the main actually thing, so when we consider DG categories, when we say that they are the same, so when we say that they are equivalent, it's called the quasi-equivalent. So it's uh, uh, the most important notion here. So we consider all. DG categories uh, modulo quasi equivalence. So quasi equivalent categories, we consider that they are the same. So, and um, we say that the uh, a differential graded functor uh, phi from A differential graded category A to B is a quasi equivalence. If for any two objects, for any two objects of the category A, of course we have a natural map from the uh, EF, from the homes from E to F over A to the homes from phi E to phi F in the B. And this is a complex. And this is also complex. And we ask that for any two objects, it will be quasi-isomorphism. So this means that it's a morphism of complexes that induces isomorphism on cohomology of these complexes. So it's a quasi-isomorphism. And uh, also, we ask that the induced functor on the homotopy level between homotopy categories 
is an equivalent. Is an equivalent. So this is a definition of quasi-equivalence. And finally, we say that two categories, two differential graded categories A and B are quasi-equivalent. If, if there is a sequence of uh, DG functors that are quasi-equivalents between them. So because uh, it's not, uh, uh, no, no reason to, so if we have uh, two categories, no, no reason to think that we have a DG functor from one category to another. But it's possible that there is a sequence of DG categories and the functors here, that all of them are quasi-equivalents. Uh, actually, uh, uh, it uh, can be proved that actually enough just only one roof here. So just only one category C that is called cofibric replacement. I'm not going again to talk about it. So enough to consider just only one roof here. So, and we consider our DG categories, so modular uh, such quasi-equivalent. So we don't, uh, no, no, no reason uh, to, uh, to, to, to think that they are different, they are the same. So these, these DG categories are the same, and these, uh, uh, these give quasi-equivalence enhancement of the same uh, homotopy category equivalent homotopy categories, so the same. And, um, and finally, just a few words what I want to say here. I want to say that for perfect complexes and the uh, unbounded derived category of quasi-coherent shifts, who has a natural enhancement. So there are natural natural enhancements, uh, not one. I mean that we can consider different natural enhancements, but they are will, uh, all of them are will be quasi-equivalent. And for example, uh, one of such enhancement is coming from, if you want, injective resolutions. How, how to get it? Just we have to uh, remember the definition of derived category and the um, derived category coming from the category of complexes. But we can consider the category of, not the category of complexes of over complexes of quasi-coherent shifts on X, but uh, uh, we can consider v, uh, it's as a DG category. How to, uh, how to, uh, uh, what is definition of this DG category? So it's a complexes. Objects are complexes. So now we can consider the complex of all homes between them with a natural differential. So not just a, so if we have a complex and two complexes. So usually we say that it's a morphism, it's a just a degree zero and it's commute with these arrows. It's, a, it's, an, it's a just a natural definition of a category of complexes. But now we can consider all morphisms, no, not only degree uh, zero, but all degrees. So, and we get uh, some kind of uh, huge complex, uh, huge graded uh, object. And after that, we have a complex that is coming from the commuting of differential with the signs there. So we get the complex. And it's, uh, this gives us the natural uh, definition of this category as a di differential graded category here. So finally, we can consider here the subcategory of so-called uh, uh, homotopy injective, H injective, uh, uh, resolutions and objective objects. And by definition, uh, object I belong to this uh, 
subcategory if uh, the complex of home uh, from I to any acyclic object in the homotopy category of complexes is actually zero, where n is a cyclic, uh, a cyclic, any cyclic complex. So what this means? So a cyclic means that it doesn't have any kind of cohomology. So all cohomologies are trivial. We have a here we have a subcategory of a cyclic uh, differential graded subcategory of a cyclic complexes on X. And now we say that I is a H injective if we don't have a, uh, I'm sorry, it, it's a projective, so injective in the opposite uh, direction. So if we don't have uh, any homes from a cyclic com uh, complex to this ob complex in the homotopy category. So this means that the, uh, on the other word, so this means that home from a cyclic complex to complex I is a complex that is a, a cyclic, doesn't have any cohomologies here. So that's all. So this gives us the subcategory, DG subcategory of in, uh, H injective complex or objects, complexes. And now the category, unbounded category of quasi coherent shifts is a theorem, but it's a more or less direct. It's a homotopy category of these injective resolutions. H uh, homotopy injective resolutions. So this means that this DG category is enhancement of this triangulated category. And of course, for any subcategory, for example, for perfect complexes, that is subcategory on this triangulated category of X, so we have an induced uh, enhancement here. It's just DG subcategory in the injective X. Uh, that is uh, over this category here. So it's uh, objects are exactly these objects here. So it's give you uh, enhancement here. This is enhancement of this category and this is enhancement of induced enhancement of any subcategory. So this means that what I finally want to say, I finally want to say that we have a natural enhancement here. And um, mm, it's exactly that uh, we are going to consider. So, uh, so main idea now to to change 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 x uh, with uh, by uh, these DG uh, these uh, differential graded categories. And uh, now I want to say a few words about differential gradient algebras, but it's a particular case, of course, the differential gradient category. So what is differential gradient category? This is just a differential gradient. Uh, differential alg algebra is ju just a differential gradient category with one object, as a usually. So it's just idea. I, I, I said that. Um, idea uh, that we ch uh, we change x with this uh, differential gradient category, but now I want to formulate it the result that uh, allow us to uh, introduce the non-commutative varieties. And for it, I just want to remind some definitions. That is, a, so E is a differential gradient algebra. What is differential gradient algebra? I can give a definition, but I just can say now that it's a differential gradient category with one object. That is differential gradient uh, algebra, okay? So uh, never mind, but you, of course it's uh, some kind of uh, gradient algebra with a differential that is Leibniz rule and d square is equal to zero. Everything is here. But for any differential gradient algebra, as a for any small differential gradient category also, we can define the, uh, so we can consider uh, so I just want to say that we can consider the derived category of all modules that by definition the quotient of the homotopy category of uh, differential gradient modules by homotopy subcategory of a cyclic uh, uh, module. So this is a uh, is for variety for differential gradient category, we have a 
category of all modules, that is also differential graded category. So I mean that if you consider differential graded modules over differential graded algebras as the complexes of quasi-coherent shifts, they form the, they have a natural uh, natural structure of differential graded category here, just the same. And we have a homotopic category, it's a triangulated, and we have a cyclic subcategory here as before, also differential graded subcategory. And we have a definition of the uh, derived category of uh, all differential graded modules over differential graded algebra. And also we have a notion of the perfect complexes here as a compact object in this uh, big category. And it also has another description as the smallest, the smallest triangulated subcategory that contains that contains E as an object and closed under taking di direct summons. So I want to say here that for any differential graded algebra E, so let us maybe pass on the new blackboard. So for any differential gradient algebra E, we have, we can define the derived category of all uh, modules over this category and the triangulated category of perfect uh, modules here that is coincide that with the uh, compact objects of the, this big category. And also we have we have DG version. So we have uh, enhancements of this category that is uh, just the same H injective, for example, uh, uh, H injective modules, or uh, we have also another enhancement that is H projective modules, but they are quasi equivalent. And we also can uh, obtain the uh, differential gradient category that is enhancement of the category, triangulated category of perfect uh, complexes over E. So I want to say that for any DG algebra E, we can produce the same, the same, the same objects. So I mean that we can produce the pair of uh, uh, differential gradient category that is enhancement of DE. So we can produce a triangulated category DE and perf E, and we can produce DG version of this DG enhancement of these uh, triangulated categories. That's all that I want to say. And the procedure is the same, so I don't want to repeat it. Yes, of course, if If, if, if E is just the algebra concentrated in, de, 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 uh, in, in, in degree zero, that, of course, DE is just DA. It's a de derived category of modules. That's all, of course, yeah. And um, it's a, some kind of way to define the non-commutative variety. And before to give a definition, I want to give a theorem that is due to Bernard Keller that says as the following. So for any x that is quasi compact and separated or quasi if you want separated there is 
a differential gradient algebra E such that the triangulated category of quasi-coherent shifts on X is actually equivalent to the triangulated category of modules over this E. And of course, as the perfect complexes on X is equivalent to the perfect complexes over E. And moreover, uh, of course, we have a quasi-equivalence on the uh, differential, uh, uh, dif uh, differential gradient category. So it's a quasi-equivalence to the perf E. So this equivalence between triangulated categories is coming from the quasi-equivalence on, on the DG level. And um, what kind of remark here? So I, I think that I have to stop here a little bit just to give a thing about it, because it's a very important uh, point in my talk, and give a few remarks here. So uh, why we have it? How it's coming, actually? Uh, why we have a DG algebra E? Uh, because how to find, for example, uh, this DG algebra? It's re really easy. So what actually Keller proved? So let us consider the category, the differential gradient category of perfect complexes on X. And if you remember, Neiman result say us that this category has a classical generator. Let us take the classical generator here, is a classical generator. If we have an object here, we have a home, maybe such home from E to itself in this category of perf X. And what is it? It's a differential gradient algebra. So any home from object to itself in differential gradient category is just a differential gradient algebra. And what is actually Keir theorem says us that for any such case, the exactly category of perfect complexes over E is equivalent to the category of perfect complexes of X. And the category of all modules over E is equivalent to the category of quasi-coherent shifts of X. So this means that you can take a lot of such differential gradient algebras because you can find a lot of classical, take a lot of classical generators. So for example, if you have a classical generator, you can add any kind of object to this uh, classical generator and you uh, obtain again the new classical generator, but the uh, algebra of uh, endomorphism will be uh, different. So, so we have a lot of such DG algebras actually, but the result that any kind of our uh, quasi-compact and quasi-separated, uh, separated, let us say, but separated uh, scheme, uh, we have that it's uh, coming from uh, so the category of perfect complexes and the category of quasi-coherent shifts derived coming from the category of perfect complexes over some uh, differential gradient algebra. So it's exactly the point, what is the definition now, how we define what is a non-commutative uh, and derived scheme. So the definition that I use, so uh, let me uh, uh, now, uh, 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 I will omit every time now the derived. I just talk non-commutative. So a uh, non-commutative scheme uh, is a differential gradient category of the form perf E where where e is a differential gradient algebra and now i say some words what kind of differential gradient algebra here uh, that is cohomologically bounded 
So, uh, and triangulated category DE is called, will be called uh, the derived, unbounded derived category of quasi coherent shifts. on this non-commutative scheme. And the same, the perf, uh, triangulated category of perf E is the same. I mean that triangulated category of perfect complexes on this non-commutative scheme. And I said that I ask that they, it's cohomologically bounded because actually in this case, I mean that if you have a classical generator that is a perfect complex on the quasi compact and separated scheme that actually this differential gradient category is cohomologically bounded. So cohomologically bounded means it has a finitely a many non-trivial cohomologies. That's all. Is the, is e part of the structure or just E? E is not a part of the structure. So the, I said that the, it's a this category, DG category. Of course, up to up to quasi-equivalence. As I said before, there are a lot of different DG algebras that give the same DG category. Because you can take another classical generator. So D E isn't really well defined from a such a scheme. From a scheme, it's a well defined with DG category. Everything is well defined for the usual x. D of E is defined because it's a derived it's category. For, usual x. for a non commuted scheme x, you're saying that D of x is D of E. It's a, yes, okay. But, but E isn't part of the structure. So there are many D of E's. No. Because there are many E's. No. They're all quasi equivalent. No. Because what is non-commutative scheme now? It's, a, it's, not a, a, it's not a foundation of mathematics. It's a li little bit advanced. So I mean that the non-commutative scheme, it's a differential gradient category of the such form, OK? If you have a differential gradient category of the such form, then after that, we can construct this triangulated category and this triangulated category directly. It's, it's uniquely defined, OK? Because this category is just a homotopy category of this guy. And this category is e easily defined as a category of uh, derived category of all modules over this differential gradient category. I didn't say what is it, but anyway. So it's directly defined up to equivalence. If these categories are well defined without talking about E. It's just you need to say this category. Here it's a directly just homotopy. Here it's just considerable modules over it. That's all. So, and now I want to say about properties of these uh, non-commutative varieties and about the uh, 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 geometric realization. So at first, what kind of properties we can say uh, directly? So we can say, so wh what kind of properties we are interested in for the usual scheme? So for the usual scheme, uh, we are interested in some properties like proper, properness, and smoothness, and regularity. So let me say how to uh, say about non-commutative scheme when it's proper, when it's smooth, when it's irregular. Okay, so the uh, proper, it's uh, really easy. I mean that it's a uh, definition is following. Again, uh, at first in the terms of E, and but it uh, actually doesn't depend on E. On e. So a non-commutative scheme, perf, perf E is proper is called proper if, for example, so or a one or a two, so equivalent properties, equivalent properties. 
So the uh, algebra, differential gradient algebra, E uh, has a finitely dimensional cohomology. So dimension of all cohomologies is just a finite over K. Or uh, it's in, ter in terms of E, but also it can be said in terms of the whole category for any two objects, U and V from here. The actually, if you consider the uh, all uh, cohomologies of Holmes from U to V and consider the sum, it will be finite dimensional. The first condition, so it's in term of, of just one algebra E. So if you consider cohomologies of E and consider, uh, uh, and consider the dimension of, consider the sum of all cohomologies and dimension is a finite. So it's a finite dimensional, the cohomologies is a finite dimensional algebra, that's all. So we have a finitely many cohomologies, as I said. And uh, 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 the, the, uh, all these cohomologies are finite dimensional also, that's all. But it also can be said that it's uh, more. So for any two objects actually here, not only for E, for any two objects, if you consider the complex of homes between these two objects, then it uh, has a finitely many cohomologies and all of them are finite dimensional. Okay? So why uh, such uh, definition? Uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's true for a scheme, of course. And this proposition the following, at least what we know at this moment, the proposition is following. Mm, let x be a separated scheme of finite type. Then x is proper if perf x is proper. So you can see that actually the definition I said in the terms of differential gradient category, but this property is a property of triangulated category of perf E. Because the cohomology is exactly the Holmes in the triangulated category. So it, it's not a property of differential gradient category, it's a property of triangulated category, homotopic category. So another definition that's due to Maxim, it's a definition of uh, smoothness. So perf E is smooth. If E is a perfect, perfect object, perfect complex uh, as a bimodal, as the bimodal, so or the same as uh, the object as a model over as a model over E opposite tensor E over K. So look, this definition, it's exactly in term of E. And it's not trivial statement uh, that is proved by Valera Lund that actually doesn't depend on E, but it's a property of this uh, differential gradient category. And you can see that it's a property of differential gradient category, not triangulated. So we say that this object is a perfect as an object of this uh, differential gradient, uh, differential gradient um, uh, algebra, if you want. And also you see that it depends over k because we have a tensor product here over k. And if you know that smoothness depends on the base field. So I mean that regularity is not, doesn't depend on base field, but smoothness depends on base field. So I mean that, for example, non uh, 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 inseparable extension of the fi uh, 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 field is a n n not smooth. 
scheme, but it's of course a regular. So, uh, and the, again, the proposition here that is due to Valera Lunds that x is a, uh, again, x as above, let me uh, separate scheme of finite type, then x is smooth, smooth, it's equivalent that the differential graded category perf x is smooth. And let me repeat again that before you have to prove that this property, it's a property of this differential graded category, but not a property of algebra E. So it doesn't depend on E. It's before this theorem. But anyway, it's, it's true. Yes. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I have just five minutes, okay? Let us, your question will be exactly the time uh, outside of my talk because it's, uh, I, I, I want to, uh, and your question will be the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, and um, let me say the definition of the uh, regularity. So definition of regularity, so uh, perf E is regular if uh, the category, triangulated category, oh, so it's a property of triangulated category, <laughs> if triangulated category of perfect complexes uh, has a strong generator. has a strong generator. So of course I have to say what is a strong generator. So we know that the category perf E uh, has a classical generator. Uh, so for example, E is a classical generator. So E is a classical generator of this category perf E. But strong generator means that we can generate our category for the finite number of steps. What kind of steps here? So uh, just briefly, because I don't have a time. So at first, if we have a classical generator of a triangulated category e, e, T, so the first we can consider the category, uh, subcategory that contains all shifts, shifts, all direct summons, summons and finite direct sums. And after that, we can, by induction, make the following procedure. So if we have a previous uh, category and E1, we can consider the uh, new category as a, uh, in some kind of extension of these two categories. So object here are just an object that can be included in the triangle where this guy belongs to the EK minus 1 and this guy belongs to E1. And after that, again, we take all direct summons here. So we can repeat this procedure. So if E is a classical generator, then the union of all such uh, subcategories is exactly the T. It's the same to say that E is a classical generator. So it generates the whole category. But the union here, for uh, if we take the all key here, but if we, we can obtain T for the finite number of steps, then we say that E is a strong generator. So this generates the category for the finite number of steps. It's a definition of the strong generator here. And um, exactly the definition of the regularity, it's exactly that this category has a strong generator. And the theorem, uh, just to say what, why it's called Regularity, because again, it's exactly the property that for usual schemes uh, uh, holds in a regular case. And the theorem is the following. So the proposition or the theorem actually that I, I write in the such 
not concrete form scheme x is regular, it's equivalent that the category of perf x has a strong generator. So now we have to say what kind of scheme, what kind of property here. So I have a proof that is pretty short uh, for the case when x is a Noetherian of finite cruel dimension. And the product of x with itself over k is also Noetherian. So some kind of technical properties. Proof is short, but I'm not Neiman actually when he uh, when we talk about this property of regularity. He sent me some kind of preprint. It's not published yet, but anyway. So uh, that is a more general statement he has, but it's a long, uh, it's, it's a, the whole paper uh, uh, devoted to this uh, property. So, and the statement is the following that X, uh, he proves that when X is quasi compact, compact separated, and, and has a covering such that all uh, affine covering such that all uh, you uh, ri is a finite global di dimension ri finite global dimension so it's pretty general statement i think that uh, generalization of this statement here just only maybe quasi separateness here that's all so i mean that it's definitely should be i mean that that is a finite global dimension locally it's a, it's 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 not possible to 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 do something else here so i think that it's a exactly here and unfortunately i think that i have to stop here thank you very much yeah